All right, Mark chapter 10. We're going to start at verse 32. And they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. And they were amazed. And those who followed were afraid. And taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was to happen to him, saying, See, we are going to up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after three days, he will rise. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, we are able. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I'm baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those whom it has been prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that there are those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. Whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. God, we pray this morning that through the power of the Holy Spirit, that you grant us the ability to hear and to apply be changed by your word. God, I pray that you grant me the ability through the power of the Holy Spirit to preach the truth that's found in your word. God, I pray for your people this morning. Whatever they're dealing with, whatever burdens they're carrying, whatever sorrows they feel, Whatever it is that is affecting them right now, God, I pray that you allow each of us to lay those things aside and attentively hear your word and remember who you are. For yours is the name above all names. God, I pray that we feel your presence and your peace comfort during this time that we have together. And I pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. You know, uh, I'm, I'm one that looks for deals, and I find deals, and then when you find deals, you have to go, you know, pick things up in different parts of town. And so I found myself doing that this Friday, and I had it all mapped out. I had my plan. I knew my mileage, I knew the amount of time it was going to take, I knew where I was going to go, and I knew how I was going to fit it into my day, how it was all going to work out. So I had the plan mapped out, Misty asked me, how long are you going to be gone? I said, about an hour and a half. So, and usually, give or take, I'm right on the money. And so, I set off, I'm on my way, and lo and behold, on 485, something isn't right. And I come to find out that I had blown out a tire on the back of my car. And so that hour and a half trip turned into a much longer day. And that's actually affecting, you know, even our week this week as we're trying to plan around 
all of that. So things didn't go the way that I pictured them going. In fact, if I was sitting on the side of the road there thinking to myself how different this day would have been if I would have just made some different decisions. Because things weren't going the way that I expected them to go. I think you all know how that feels when you have expectations around a day or a week or a year. Maybe you have greater expectations around where your life would be or where things would go in a certain direction, only to have your expectations dashed, changed. It's hard sometimes to process. Most of the time, our frustrations come from unmet expectations. Why are we frustrated? Because we expected things to be different. We expected things to go differently. We didn't see what was ahead of us. You know, we talked much throughout our series in the book of Mark about what greatness means in the kingdom of God, that Jesus redefines it for his disciples. He teaches them and shows them that greatness in the eyes of the world is not what greatness looks like in the kingdom of God. People inherently want to do great things, but the question is what does greatness look like to Jesus? And when we're following Jesus, what should we expect? What should our expectations be? Jesus many times attempts to set expectations for his disciples. Both in the time that they're living in now and the time to come, he is setting expectations for them. The problem is, is that many, many times they don't understand or want to accept what he's saying but Jesus is setting the expectation for them. He's showing them where things are going. And it's also important if you think, and we've talked about this many times, the audience of who would initially have read this, this gospel account, who was initially written for, was a group of people that were Christians that were enduring intense suffering and persecution for their faith. These are people that are losing everything. People that are losing jobs, they're losing family members. Some of them are laying down their own lives because they identify as Christians. And all they really had to do was denounce their faith and they could go back to life as it was before. And so what do you say to a group of people that have lost everything on the account of Jesus. Well, we see that as Mark's preparing the gospel, he's showing them and showing us that we should expect that. That following Jesus, that we should expect sacrifice, suffering, and to serve. And that in doing so, all of those things are worth it. Following Jesus leads us in that direction, and greatness in the kingdom of God is defined by that. Let's look first in verse 32. We'll see the goal of greatness, which is sacrifice. And they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them, and they were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. Taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was going to happen saying, see, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes. They will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after three days, he will rise. Now, this is Jesus' third time where he predicts his death and resurrection. He's doing so to the disciples to set their expectations, to prepare them for what is coming and to even show them that what is coming is necessary and is planned and is part of God's will. That the disciples really have a hard time accepting it. 
And when you don't want to accept something, it's really easy to miss things. When you don't want to hear something, it's really easy to miss things, to not see things. But Jesus is making it very clear to them what is, is coming for him. And what we see here also that's very interesting is Jesus is leading the way. Jesus is leading the disciples at this point. He's on ahead of them, knowing what he's facing, knowing what he's going to encounter, knowing what's coming for him. You know, I think about just small things in my life where it's hard to lead the way. You know, I work out with a group of guys, and it's, it, we don't have AC or heat or anything like that. So there's some mornings where, you know, at 6 o'clock, 6.30 in the morning, it's 15 degrees outside. You know, and you know that before you go to bed, that it's going to be 15 degrees the next morning. And so that whole process of getting out of bed and going there and doing that is really feels like work. And it would be really easy for me to just say no. You know what would be even harder? For me to lead people to do that that don't want to come with me. It's easier for me to show up, no other people are going to be there, no other people can kind of lead me in that direction, but it's a lot harder, isn't it, to lead others when you know what you're leading them towards and you know what you're facing. And we see here that Jesus is so committed to the purpose of why he came, so committed to the will of the Father over his own, right? That he is leading the way towards the cross. Jesus knows what's coming for him, and Jesus is leading the way. And he's showing the disciples, and he's showing us why he came. You know, it's even this morning, as we were singing words proclaiming Christ, we were, we were singing, partly we were singing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah not because the Lamb is going to overcome. Not because one day victory will be secured. Not, day, not because we hope that the Lamb will overcome. We sing hallelujah because the Lamb has overcome. And that's why Jesus came. Jesus came to overcome the sting of sin, which is death. Jesus came to do what you and I could never do. Jesus came so that these words mattered. It is finished. The work has been completed. The victory has been secured. Christ has been victorious. Jesus knew why he came. And he was showing the disciples the reason he came. See, the whole point, the whole time, the disciples are just waiting for the time when Jesus kind of takes the throne, reestablishes Israel. When they start to be on the winning side, Jesus is showing them his purpose is much greater than that because their need is much greater than that. Jesus shows us why he came. Jesus also leads us in places that we might not expect. Matthew 16, 24, Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. See, the key to following Jesus is laying down your life. It's a sacrifice. A life that's lived for Jesus looks like a life that has been laid down for Jesus. It's following him. It's trusting him. It's allowing him to lead the way. 
You know one thing that we see here is that of all the things that the disciples did wrong, and we're going to see many things here this morning, of all the ways that they were not faithful, of all the ways that they didn't believe, all the ways they doubted, we do see that one thing that they continued to do, and that is they continued to follow. Do you see that? They continued to follow. There's times in your life where you don't know where everything's going. You don't know where Jesus is leading you. You don't know how things are going to work out. You don't know how you're going to get through this situation. You're trying to be obedient to the word of God and you don't know how things are going to play out because of that. You don't know where things are headed. You don't know what your future looks like. But you know a key thing in your life? It's not having all the answers. It's not knowing all the details. It's not seeing how it all works out. It's continuing to follow Jesus. Think about the people that would have been initially reading this. Chaos is ensuing around them. They're losing everything. They don't know how the future is going to work out. They don't know what tomorrow is going to hold. They don't know what's next. What are they being encouraged to do? Keep following Jesus. Just keep following Jesus. Jesus meets us in our doubts. He meets us in our dis disbelief. He meets us when our hearts are hardened. He meets us when we're selfish. He meets us when we're prideful. Jesus meets them there as they continue to follow him. To follow Jesus is also to be part of the mission of Jesus. You know, the disciples, the purpose of following Jesus is not just simply to make their life better. It surely wasn't to make their life easier. They were following Jesus to be a part of the mission of Jesus. And it seldom leads us to comfort. But it always leads us to purpose. See, following Jesus seldom leads you to comfort. But it always leads you to the purpose. See, there's a point to all of it. They weren't following Jesus aimlessly. Jesus was not leading them aimlessly. They weren't just kind of wandering around, healing people and doing things and spreading the word. They might have felt like that at times. It may have felt like that was what their life was. There may have been times where they couldn't put everything together and things didn't make sense. There may have been times where they wondered what the point of all of this is. But the key we see in following Jesus is there's always purpose. There's always purpose in following to be a part of the mission. And when you're on mission, the point is no longer you. When the church is on mission, the point is no longer on me. It's no longer on you. We can have a me-centered view of everything. We can have a me-centered view of our lives. We can have a me-centered view of, of the church. We can have a me-centered view in our families. But see, when you're on mission, you're following Jesus, the point becomes him. And the point becomes others. But Jesus is showing them why he came. He's showing them the mission. He's showing them what he's there to do. He's showing them what it looks like to follow him. 
Jesus never leads us aimlessly. You know why that's good news? Because that means that as you're following Jesus, and you're committed to following Jesus, it means there's always a purpose. Even when it doesn't make sense to you, even when you don't understand it, there's always a purpose. It means there's purpose in your pain. There's purpose in your suffering. There's purpose when you feel disoriented or confused. There's purpose in your brokenness and despair. There's always purpose when you're following Jesus. He leads us intentionally. In verse 35, we see the path of greatness through suffering. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. Jesus said to them, You do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism of which I'm baptized? And they said to him, we are able. Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink you will drink and with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. You know, what's interesting is the different reactions that come after Jesus predicts his death, burial, and resurrection. And they're never good reactions. Really exposes like the heart of, of the disciples. In fact, three different times, this is the third time we see that Jesus, you know, is predicting his death, burial, and resurrection. And we see different reactions. Once we see Peter rebuking Jesus for that, right? Trying to put Jesus in his place. Another time we see the disciples arguing about who is the greatest, who will be the greatest. And now we see two brothers, James and John, who have come to Jesus and have in, in some ways demanded, Jesus, do what we ask you to do. We want you to do something. And we want you to tell us that you're going to do this. Very forceful. Matthew's account actually would say that it was their mom that did it for them. That they had their mom go and do this for them. And the request is very bold. They're demanding this. This is what I want from you, Jesus. This is what I want you to do for me. This is what I want you to do for us. And it kind of reminds me of the prodigal son. Right? It comes to the father, what does he do? He makes some demands. He comes to his father and he says, this is what I want you to do for me. I want you to give me my inheritance now. I want you to give me half of what you have now. I don't want to wait, you to wait for me to die. I want, I want what I want and I want it now and I want it for myself. And there's just kind of this demand that's being made to the father. And in a similar way that James and John are making this demand to Jesus, we're like, Jesus, this is what we want from you. We want you to grant this to us. We want this for ourselves. It's coming from a position of pride and arrogance and selfishness. You think about this. It also shows where they see kind of the end game. What they're aiming for is a position of prestige and power. To sit on the right and the left is a, is a high position. There's only two people that can sit there. And they would be the two most important other than the one who's in the middle. So they're acknowledging Jesus. They're getting some things right. Acknowledging that Jesus will be on the throne. Acknowledging Jesus as the Messiah. But even in the midst of that, demanding that they have a place of power and prestige 
of comfort, of security. See, they're right in desiring to take part in God's glory. The problem is they don't know the means to get there. And Jesus challenges them. He says, you don't know what you're asking. Because they don't. He said, you really don't understand what you're asking from me. You really don't understand what you are signing up for right now. You don't know what's ahead. You don't understand what true greatness looks like in the kingdom of God. And he asked them, are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink? Which means for him, the, the meaning of that is, what Jesus knows ahead, is that the full wrath of God is going to be poured out on him at the cross for our sins. Are you able to drink that? Are you able to experience the baptism that's coming from me? Which is the identifying as a sinner, suffering, persecution, and death on behalf of sinners? Bearing the judgment as his own before God. And here's what we see. That even as Jesus is, is rebuking them, challenging them, in their pride and arrogance, you know what they say? We're able. You know, and you, you think about that and you're like, what a, what a ridiculous claim for James and John to say this, to say that they're able. You and I do this often with Jesus. Oftentimes, it might not be even verbally. You might not say it with your words, but you say it with your life. You say it with your actions. You say it with your decisions. I am able. I've got this. I can handle this. I'm able, Jesus. And there in the midst of our pride and our arrogance, stand before the God of the universe. And we say, I am am able. And the response that Jesus says is, you will experience something similar. They're not obviously going to have the full wrath of God poured out on them because that is being absorbed by Jesus. Jesus is standing in our place and it's standing in their place. But they will experience suffering. And they will experience persecution. And they will experience a life of hardship. And the things not going the way that they would have pictured. Jesus is saying, that is coming for you. The hard part's coming for you. The difficult part's coming for you. That place that you want of prestige and power... That's not mine to grant. See, Jesus is submitting to the will of the Father. But he says there are difficult days that are coming for you. And then he takes this moment. So in the midst of all of this, right, there's this moment where we're going to see that Jesus is going to kind of sum all this up and bring all this together, showing us the heart of greatness, which is service. Verse 31. When the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called, called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. The great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. For whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. 
For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, give his life as a ransom for many. You know, this is very contrary to your nature, very contrary to how we're wired as sinners. Think about this. You and I, all of us, we like to be served, don't we? I mean, if you think about going to the nicest restaurant in town, wherever it's going to cost you the most money, what are you going to get there? You're going to get great service. It's part of the meal. It's good food, but there's also great service. The better the food, the more expensive it is, the greater the level of service. I've worked in both types of restaurants. I've worked at a really nice restaurant, and I've also worked at a Chili's. And I'll tell you, the people at Chili's were the worst, you know? They were the worst people to wait on. Because when you were there, you were a waiter, what do people want? They want to be served. And they want to remind you every step of the way of how you could do better, right? They were quick to point that out, let me know all the ways that I could improve as a waiter for them at Chili's. I mean, they acted, you know, they ordered a chicken sandwich, and because I brought that chicken sandwich out to them on a platter, somehow that meant that they were better than me. It's cringeworthy, isn't it, to watch people just mistreat waiters and servers. We like to be served. We like to be in the place of prestige. We like to be above others. We like to be the one getting served. Jesus says in his kingdom, it's the opposite. When you think about loving God, and as we love God, we love others. In fact, when Jesus was asked about that, what's the greatest commandment? He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. And the second one is like it. Meaning, I'm not going to answer this without also including loving others. Meaning, to love God is to love others. How do we love others? Well, you know that if you think about right now that how how have people loved me? If you wrote it down, how have I felt loved and how have people loved me? It's always going to be what? A way that they served you. It's always going to be an act of service because the way that we truly love other people is by serving other people. It's by laying down our own wants, needs, and wishes and serving and desiring what's best for someone else. I mean, think just for a moment. Have you ever heard... A wife say, you know when I just know that my husband loves me? It's those days where he comes in late, plops down on the couch, and asks what's for dinner. That's typically not a time when wives feel loved. That's typically not a good way to express your love to your wife. It's when you serve that they feel love. It's when you're being served that you feel love. We feel love when someone's serving us. We show love when we're serving others. And this is the point. Because if you notice what's happening with all the disciples and why Jesus is making this point, this is what happens. First, you have the two, James and John, that are asking for this position. Well, here's the thing about the position. There's only two slots. So guess what that does? They're asking not only give us this, Jesus, but give us this and exclude the other ten. Now, guess what happens in my home? Whenever you make brownies, inevitably, it's never an even number with their six people. So there's always going to be some like some you know leftover brownies and the math doesn't work out 
And so guess what happens if someone comes and asks one of us for a brownie? That's a loaded question, depending on how many brownies are in the pan, right? So if it's a pan full of brownies, you ask me for a brownie, basically all I'm granting you is to get a brownie. But if there's one left, what you're asking for is, can I have that brownie over everyone else in the family? That's what you're asking. And that's what James and John are doing here. And guess what happens with the disciples? They're indignant about it. How dare they? How dare they ask such a question? How dare they put themselves in that type of position? How dare they even ask Jesus for that? Exclude all of us. But you know what's in their heart there? You know why they're indignant? What about me? I'm being excluded. Here's five reasons why I deserve it over, the, over they deserve it. Like, that's not fair for them. How dare they? And that's why Jesus pulls them all together. And this is what he's going to say to them, okay? And he's, and he's pulling all of us together, right? Through his word. And he says to them, you know what? He says, let me tell you about what greatness looks like. Let, let me tell you what it means to love other people. Let me tell you what it means to be great in the kingdom of God. And, and not only is he telling them this, he's modeling it. He's going to show them. He's going to say, you know, you know what greatness looks like in the kingdom of God? It's not when you seek power and prestige and title and, and what people are, are going to think. And, and it's not when you live your life on, on what's in it for me and how can people serve me and what can I get. You know, you know what greatness looks like in the kingdom of God? When, when, you, when you lay your life down for the sake of others. When you seek to serve and not be served. When you seek the good of others over the good of yourself, that's what greatness looks like in the eyes of God. And Jesus is the ultimate model of that. He did that for us first in every way. From his birth to his life on earth to his death to his burial and resurrection, Jesus came in humility as a servant to serve others. He came to sacrifice. He came to suffer. He came to serve. Following Jesus for you means walking down the same road. It means following the same path. It means having the same posture. Following Jesus means Loving people the way Jesus first loved you. Submitting to the will of the Father the way Jesus first did on our behalf. Following Jesus will involve sacrifice. It will involve suffering. It always involves service. And it's all worth it. See, to show the love that Jesus has first shown you, we are called to love others by serving them. Do you, know what, do you, do you want to know what greatness looks like in the eyes of God? Look no further than the life of Jesus. He's our model He's our example, he's our savior, and he's our Lord. And he is a Lord that is worthy to be followed. Let us pray. God, thank you for your word. And thank you for the truth that's found in your word. God, I know that for everyone that's gathered here today, we know that what your word calls us to do is hard. We know that our sinful natures, we feel oftentimes at war with ourselves. 
But God, we know that it's through the power of the Holy Spirit that you give us the ability to live for you. That you give us the grace necessary to follow you. God, I pray for your people this morning that you grant them that grace. That wherever they are, we know that you meet us there. God, I pray for those that are seeking to follow you and struggling. Pray, God, they don't give up. Pray, God, for those that are in situations and they don't know what to do. I pray that they trust you. God, I pray for those that maybe have lately or for a long time been living their lives primarily for themselves. God, I pray you show them the joy through your word of laying down their lives and their plans the way Jesus did, loving other people the way Jesus did. The true abiding joy comes not from being served, but from serving others. God, help us. It's in your name we pray. Amen.